to start, I would like to welcome you wholeheartedly to this conference on the improvement of um, rail transport um, for freight in the European Union, making rail transport attractive in the EU and globally. It is being um, organized by the left group of the European Parliament, the left um, and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Brussels. One technical uh, information for you, all the presentations will be recorded today and afterwards they will be uploaded. Uh, uh, but the discussion, however, will not be recorded. So you can rest assured that we can openly discuss anything we want to discuss. You will find the interpretation into English, German and Czech, and you will have to click on the globe icon and the lower right hand frame of your Zoom window. And uh, we hope that you can hear us well. As I said before, there will be a um, report on the conference afterwards, and I will be sending it out to everyone who's interested in order to keep um, up with the reports. What are we going to talk about? Uh, we will be talking about the um, um, question of how uh, rail transport can be made more attractive. It's a follow-up conference uh, to a conference that we organized at the um, start of the year. Uh, 2021 was declared as the European Year of the Rail, and we would like to take stock on the present situation, how to improve and uh, promote further rail transport. Uh, what are the results that we can see already from the European Year of the Rail? And um, we would also like to put that into relation with the uh, road transport and the freight transport more particularly on the road. Let me introduce first of all our panelists. Um, uh, Cornelia Ernst will be holding a keynote uh, this um, afternoon. She has been active, an active member for many, many years of the left group in the European Parliament. Uh, she is from Germany and um, lives in the uh, region of Saxony and Poland on the very close to the border. After her, we will hear from Herwig Schuster. He's a, an expert on rail traffic in Greenpeace Europe, and he will be um, representing Lorelei Limousin today. Unfortunately, she has fallen sick, and we're very happy to have Havik, uh, who will speak to us later. Then Christina Tilling, she's the head of land transport of the European Transport Workers Federation. And after that, we will uh, take a, a very short break, giving you an opportunity to put your questions and we'll have a, a little debate. And then we will be talking about um, the freight transport on the road. And Volsan Liem will be uh, giving a presentation from the International Transport Workers uh, Federation. And we're very happy that you made it because um, the ITF is organizing a mobility week right away and you're very busy. So um, welcome. And Katerina Kotnitschka will be speaking uh, after her. She's a, also a member of the left group in the European Parliament, um, a me member of the Committee on Transport and Tourism. And she is uh, has been elected the chairperson of the left party in the Czech Republic. And we would like to congratulate her on her election. And now Connie has the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, on this very beautiful day uh, with lots of sun, I think we should have started 5 to 12 because uh, the situation that we find in transport, road transport, rail transport everywhere, it's 5 to 12, I can tell you. And I, I'm a witness um, to it all because I can look out of my window onto the motorway. It, it goes down to Romania and Italy or to, uh, over to Belarus. And um, it's, it's a bit of a 
a hub, really, a node, uh, if you like. Um, and I'm not a member of the Transport Committee, as my uh, colleague, my dear colleague, um, Katerina Kornetska, who knows the situation so much better than I do. But from my personal experience, I know that it's a very, very important topic for so many people out there. In the uh, industry committee, we also deal with questions uh, concerning um, transport because so many things are interlinked with uh, transport that happen in industry research and energy so we must also take uh, the situation in transport on board if we want um, a, a radical change in transport then there cannot be any question as to the necessity uh, but uh, the mobility change paradigm change must first happen in the heads of people because let's look at what's happening on the roads on the rails and how do we want to organize a transport in the different different areas um, we also will have to discuss individual transport um, so I think we really have to look at things more globally in an integrated uh, matter. On the 24th of February, we already had a conference on the uh, subject, but we were considering the transborder rail transport at the time. And we uh, already heard that um, rail transport was so neglected, neglected over decades. And there are really areas and lines that um, have totally fallen apart and need to be there needs to be a remedy for that so much of the freight has been loaded onto the roads and um, that's very unfortunate we also need much more cooperation in order to improve the connectivity of rail transporter um, transport and we also need more connectivity between road and rail. We also need um, good ideas, uh, new projects to move forward to make pr real progress in this area. And we need to clarify what will it mean for the workers. Perhaps we'll also have to talk about a kind of just transition in the transport area. And we, as a party, looking at uh, social repercussions uh, always, we really need to, uh, to consider uh, the social repercussions on the workers, on their living and working conditions, on their wages and so on. So let's look at uh, how we can improve rail traffic across the borders, but also inside individual countries. And I really look forward to working on some concrete proposals here today. And I'm very happy that we'll be given um, an example from Korea, because there are some very good uh, practice uh, examples out there. Uh, and perhaps these examples can also be replicated in Europe. So what we need our plans for a fair transition, for a future for our workers, and for new definitions of our transport sectors. It's very, very hard on everyone because people don't like those massive changes, but we have to change, definitely, because otherwise we have no future. So I'm very happy that this conference is taking place. I wish you much luck and very good ideas and a good debate to everyone. Thanks. Der erste Teil jetzt im Juli äh, vorgelegt wurde von der Kommission. The first part of this Fit for 55 package has been introduced by the Commission this summer. So the question is, how can we manage a just transition also for the mobility and transport sector? And now I would like to give the floor to Havik Schuster from Greenpeace Europe. Havik. Thank you very much from Vienna. Thank you very much for the invitation to today's conference. I'm always pleased to be invited as a guest speaker to such a conference. I don't think I have to explain Greenpeace, but uh, maybe I should say that our transport campaign has been the most recent campaign at European level, so I should like to give a few 
explanations about our main goals. What are we working on in terms of transport? And why is it something that we worry very much about considering the European level? At first, uh, we are focusing on a reduction of the transport volume overall. That means passenger transport, talking about video conferencing, for example, but also freight transport, less cargo, less transport, etc. And the second issue is a massive shift, uh, the so-called modal shift, that is the shift from road to rail, and also uh, sea transport. Two, three years ago, we commissioned a major study on this topic that is called the EU Transport Roadmap. And the goal of the study, I will share my screen. The goal of the study was to contract two institutes in Belgium and in Germany to see how can, can uh, the transport sector be decarbonized by 2040. So the result is a huge mix of measures. I don't think there's this one fit for all solution that can be applied to every sector. I think we need various sectors for the various sector, uh, various solutions for the various sectors. Looking at this graphic that shows the number of measures that are necessary. Here, uh, the two blue parts concern the technological change. So we need more efficiency and we need to shift to alternative technologies, especially electric uh, mobility as much in the passenger sector as well as in the freight and cargo sector. The smaller blue part that is uh, synthetic fuels that are uh, mainly in the aviation sector and uh, only for the remaining long haul sector because short haul sector uh, foresees a shift from aviation to rail. As much as uh, other fuels are concerned, we don't see that in the technological change because it's not efficient and I think we should uh, mainly use renewables uh, of course some are talking about hydrogen as a solution and uh, in the aviation sector are synthetic fuels on the right hand side you see the systemic change that is necessary for one the avoidance of tr transport, then the shift to environmentally friendly transport modes where the rail is playing a major role and then also the ban on uh, combustion engine cars. So these are the major blocks and I think there is no one size fits all solution, we need several solutions. And there is a second graphic that I would like to show you when we talk about the freight transport. Ideally, that would be the distribution of uh, the transport by 2040. So uh, drastic reduction of lorry transport and uh, the shift to the sea and rail transport. And aviation, of course, in terms of cargo is less important. So this is where we should go in the future. And of course, as far as uh, the lorry transport is concerned, that would mean to reduce uh, lorries from about 6 million per year to 3 to 4 million uh, lorries in the European Union. So this study is the framework for our campaign. Before we had uh, the year of the European Rail, so a strong focus on uh, rail transport. Manuela mentioned that uh, we 
could take, talk, uh, take stock uh, about this European year of rail today. I think that's a bit premature. For now, we haven't really seen much results as far as the European year of rail are concerned. Of course, several initiatives were presented and that's a good thing, but I think what we have to wait for is the European Action Plan for the cross-border rail transport. That is something that we can probably expect for December by the Commission. And at least for us at Greenpeace, we haven't really heard much about how ambitious these goals and this action plan is supposed to be. As far as our demands are concerned, with regard to the rail transport, of course we have several demands. Maybe I can briefly talk about the four major areas. One demand concerns the cooperation between the rail companies so that the European rail operators can have a closer cooperation because uh, I recently went to Barcelona by train and I had to buy my tickets from three different rail operators and it took three hours to get my ticket and I think uh, that's just simply not acceptable and it's really difficult, for example, companies to transport their cargo from uh, Austria to France. So logistically it's just not feasible simply because uh, the rail operators are not cooperating closely enough. And the second part is investment. We need mass a massive shift of investment from the aviation sector and the construction of roads towards the rail sector. Our approach is that, especially with concern to cross-border connections, we need to invest rapidly so that we can avoid bottlenecks. Basically, it's much more important and much more efficient if we invest in existing lines. And that's something we see quite critically because a lot of investment is going into new lines that are being built. And I think it's much more important, especially with regard to Eastern Europe, we invest in existing lines that so far are still with a very low speed, for example, so that we can increase the speed instead of investing in new projects. So I think we should have a shift in investment. And the major part of our demands is concerning the fact that other transport modes should have framework conditions that are worse. For example, the kerosene tax for the aviation sector or uh, no rail toll or no VAT for uh, rail tickets, etc. So we need to make uh, clear that uh, these transport modes are actually connected to real costs. And I think that this truth about the costs needs also to be factored in with regard to the social costs, because we want people to use the rail instead of the road and aviation. And so, of course, it shouldn't cost more than it currently does. So we need to factor in the social costs as well, because at the moment, l rail tickets are much more expensive than low-cost airlines, for example. And that has been a problem for many years. So I think we should actually uh, take measures so that we can reach decarbonizing the transport sector. So several issues are at stake and I think several issues that of course need to be dealt with at national level as well. And I was asked whether or not uh, we focus on EU goals as well. I think of course it's very important for example to have a stronger approach with regard to EU issues. In Austria, for example, we have the problem that we have very many illegal lorries going through our country, bad technical standards, uh, they are exceeding the driving times, uh, excessive speed, etc. Everything that makes uh, the transport by lorries cheaper than the transport by rail. So what we can really expect from this action plan by the Commission, we don't really know, but we are at least in several areas quite
quite optimistic that something will happen and some things will be changed, especially as far as the cooperation between the rail operators is concerned. I think there will be more investment in rail infrastructure, etc., and rolling stock, for example. I think uh, there will things uh, be, to be implemented, but I don't know whether or not we can be really satisfied with this action plan. Last but not least, the COP26 in Glasgow, that's also the title of today's conference. The COP in Glasgow for us is the most important climate conference uh, since the climate conference in Paris. Of course, also because uh, there are better opportunities at a global level. And it will, of course, depend on how the global community will agree on the ways to decarbonize and uh, get out of coal, oil and uh, other fossil fuels. As far as our topic is concerned, the transport issue, I don't think we will expect any kind of concrete results at the COP26 uh, in Glasgow. That's not the major issue as well, but I think uh, when it comes to uh, decommission oil plants and everything else, that will, of course, has have repercussions on the transport sector as well. At the moment, oil is quite expensive. I hope that will stay this way, but because as uh, m quicker we can use other uh, energy sources, uh, the quicker we can decarbonize the transport sector as well. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the later discussion. Yes, thank you very much, Harvey, for your very interesting presentation and uh, the conclusion of the European Year of the Rail is a very weak one. It's the 29th of October. On uh, Sunday, the climate conference will start and uh, nothing has been submitted. But at least uh, there's always the hope that there will be progress in the cooperation of the rail companies and our left um, party will definitely take that up um, if in a very critical way. I'm very happy to invite Christina Tilling now. She's the head of the land transport section of the European Transport Workers Federation. You have the floor, please. Thank you. Um, am I heard okay? It works? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and I, I'll be uh, more than happy to bring in the uh, workers' perspective uh, to, to, this, uh, to this event. I mean, World Sun, um, after the, the coffee break, will bring additional elements, uh, definitely, and probably more concrete. But just to say that um, in the ETF, we decided to have a land transport department um, as for 1st of January, because, of course, there are... Um, um, a number of synergies between section, land transport sections, notably between road and rail. Um, and we wanted to create a better coordination between that. And you may wonder whether in our, so to say, union family, there is, there is an understanding between um, uh, trade, unions, uh, trade unions representing roads with trade unions representing rail. Um, are they on opposed positions or have they found, uh, so to say, um, um, a joint um, uh, outlook on how uh, the future of transport will look like in freight? And I'm, I have to say that uh, we see uh, the disastrous situation in road transport, and uh, that is because road transport is artificially, you know, kept artificially cheap against all our modes of transport. And we would like um, uh, to have less and better road transport for our workers. Um, and this is where we find the common ground uh, of discussions uh, between rail and road in the ETF. But that is just by way of, um, so to say, introduction and clarification. Um, I'd like just to point out that long haul transport, freight transport poses a key couple of problems, really key problems for the workers. One is work-life balance and the other one is conditions. Um, work-life balance, the longer the journey, the uh, further away and the longer periods away from the family. And as we all know, um, mobility is, uh, I mean, workers do want to spend more time with their families. 
um, pandemic uh, and the pandemic brought a new dimension to it. It made the family life very vulnerable. We all know the reasons for why um, workers want to spend more time uh, in their social environment. So when we take, talk about long distance, we see the shortage of drivers <clears throat> um, being uh, a, a, a cause of this new mentality that kicks in. <clears throat> and drivers are no longer uh, ready to rough it in parking areas and so on and so forth for weeks on end. Um, and I would imagine the same as, as the European Commission um, and the policymakers uh, step up plans to open uh, the railway um, corridors and the, the, rail, the freight, you know, the railway freight to, um, to cross border, more cross border operations we may experience the same phenomenon in terms of uh, yeah, railway uh, mobile and cross-border crews. Um, will people or railway workers want to be away from home for long periods of time? Uh, that will depend on the working conditions that will be uh, created around uh, this, this measure. Um, we know that, for example, we just take uh, the, the uh, lives of truck drivers, yeah, the shortage of well-equipped parking areas. I mean, what about the arrangements for uh, mobile crews in rail transport uh, for rest, you know, away from their countries, uh, access to sanitary facilities and so on and so forth. So there will be a key issue to be addressed by the, by the policymakers at European, but also at national level with regards to long haul rail transport if we don't want to see the same situation in road replicating in rail. And that's, um, we have the, the possibility to um, uh, address the attractiveness of a sector which is still you know, palatable to workers such as rail in a very incipient phase. Let's not uh, let things uh, you know, uh, degrade in rail as we allowed them in road transport. That will be a key message from the ETF side. Um, the probably one of the, again, most important things will be the measurement of working time in the cross-border operation, but also within the national borders. Uh, in road, we have um, the so-called digital tachograph, and we saw how important this tool is in measuring working time, in giving an indication a clear indication on the pay of the driver, but also in giving an indication of how long the driver spends outside of his or her country, you know, where the company is established. In rail, we do not have such tool. And I would see um, indeed, and we would as a section, railway transport section in the ETF, we would see an emergency of, um, you know, um, um, getting an instrument to clearly measure working time as we step up, you know, growth of cross-border railway transport. That's going to be important for the same reasons, safety to start with, but also measuring um, the entitlement, entitlements of the drivers with regards to pay. And as we all know, in rail, posting applies from moment one when a driver crosses the border, such a tool would be instrumental in not creating social dumping in rail transport. So uh, the ETF is going to, um, um, to very much um, uh, militate for um, accompanying every piece of legislation and or soft tool that the European Commission issues. And we know um, um, that a, a proposal for the revision of the train drivers re, re, uh, directive is coming soon. So we will be um, asking uh, for measures, including such tool for measuring working time to accompany any sort of um, you know, intent to um, open um, uh, indeed, uh, or to, to, to um, uh, lead to the growth of uh, cross-border rail transport in freight. I think this is instrumental. The question of training, um, and that's my last point I would like to make, um, is also to, um, one of our concerns. Uh, in road, we have minimum um, uh, requirements for training of drivers. 
Um, in rail um, for the ETF, it is not clear whether we could have that, but what we know is that there is a discrepancy between member states when it comes to training uh, of train drivers. And not only that, but the European Commission in this context wants to lower the language levels um, of cross uh, of, of um, uh, mobile crews and cross-border crews in, road tra in rail transport. And this uh, we find, um, I'd say a bit cheeky. <laughs> I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you very much for giving us uh, the perspective about two sectors, the road and rail sector, and the situation of its employees. I read that ETF demanded a few days ago to have a European year of railway workers as a response to the European Year of Rail. I think that would make a lot of sense, and I think uh, your presentation really showed that this is an important topic. I'm very much looking forward to Wolsan Lim's presentation. She will tell us about positive examples uh, when it comes to combat social dumping in the freight transport. Wolsan Lim, you have the floor. I thank you very much, um, Manuela, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it was a little bit surprising to hear that uh, the EU left in Parliament, in, the left in, in the EU Parliament, would be interested in safe rates all the way over here in Korea. Um, but I'm happy to talk about it. I think that um, uh, there are broad principles which are applicable to the Europe situation, um, which I'll try to talk about, cross-border situation, but just note that uh, the speci specificity of South Korea is quite different because of the way the market is structured and also because we're an island because of North Korea and so we don't have cross-border and so those differences are definitely there and I try to talk about Korea but also general principles and a little bit how they play out in, in some other countries. I actually have a, a presentation. So I'm going to share my slide. Can you see that? Um, it's okay. Okay, so I'll try to go this go through this uh, quickly, although it's quite a bit of uh, material. Um, sorry. Yes. So first to give you some background, and, and uh, I, I should just say also that um, Chris, Christina Tilling just mentioned we are in fact finishing a week of action was very much about safe rates, both in Korea and then uh, implementing these principles globally. And right now the safe rate system we have in Korea, which is in road transport, in uh, road, uh, road freight transport is very new. It's only uh, two years old, but it's also kind of in, in um, a, tenu a tenuous situation because there's a sunset clause and so we're fighting to maintain it as that's part of what the action week was about. But um, Korean trans road transport market is uh, characterized by multi levels of subcontracting, low cost tendering, uh, just in time uh, transport. And the diff one of the differences is that we would be over 90% um, owner driver or misclassified drivers, dependent contractors, whatever you want to call them. I think this is different from most places in Europe, although I just learned that in Turkey, for example, the market is structured similarly. This means that, that truck drivers in Korea don't have legally recognized uh, trade union rights. Um, and so the, the issues that we're talking about when we talk about safe rates are, of course, both about um, uh, working conditions or rights for truck drivers, improving them, improving pay, but it's very much about uh, improving safety. And increasingly, we also talk about this as in terms of improving uh, sustainability of the sector, both, um, well, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, but the, the logic that we're working on, this is actually from a, a scholar from uh, Australia, which is also some safe rates like systems, safe rate systems in some states and had a national system for uh, a few years. Um, basically looking at the structure of the market. And so we have big, what we call clients or economic employers. These are like retailer or um, producers, uh, manufacturers that contract for transport services. They outsource the work um, and this creates economic pressures 
uh, throughout the road transport supply chain. Um, and this uh, means that uh, drivers, uh, both there's pressures on tra transport companies to cut costs and this put pressure on drivers to drive while fatigued, use drugs to stay awake, speed and creates overloading, not maintain vehicles, and this leads to crashes. And so there's a relationship between truck drivers' conditions and uh, and uh, road safety for the, the road using public. Um, uh, safe rates is, of course, in Korea, but there's similar systems globally. I obviously can't talk about all of those, but just to, to uh, show that to you for a second. From a European perspective, I think there's three principles of a safe, safe rate system that uh, are worth uh, thinking about, both from the perspective of uh, stopping social dumping um, and uh, increasing, improving the, the conditions and livelihood for drivers, but then also from a safety and then sustainability perspective. Uh, and I also think that these are things that kind of um, complement the mobility package. Some things are in the mobility package. The one thing that is, I think, not in the mobility package that's key to a safe rate system is client responsibility. So there's, a, there's mechanisms and it's done in different ways in different countries. Uh, and I'll tell you how we do it in Korea, but there's mechanisms within the system to make sure that clients are, they're not undercutting transport companies so much that they can't pay their drivers. Um, and that's important because essentially we're saying to the, the companies with power, you have to take responsibility for right safety and sustainability. Um, the goal of the system is to equalize rates and conditions between different types of drivers. So uh, in some contexts, that's between employee drivers versus owner drivers. In Korea, we're mostly owner drivers, but in most other countries, it's, it, it's there as well as between outsource and insource, stop social dumping, and uh, reduce the incentive to do that outsourcing and using non-standard forms of employment. And then really, really key, and I think Christina mentioned this also, the monitoring and enforcement of the system is essential. And uh, in the best systems, we have uh, trade union participation in that. So those are the, the big principles. This is uh, much more complex and I won't go into it in detail. I will note that in 2019, we were able to embed these principles into uh, guidelines passed at the ILO. They're guidelines, so they're uh, agreed to by the tripartite parties of the ILO, but they, they're not an enforceable standard yet. Uh, nonetheless, we think the principles are important and it's less the guidelines themselves and more the fact that they point to principles that can be uh, implemented in different contexts. And so we've been, this is part of what we're also talking about during the action week. Um, and I think, uh, so I won't go into all of this, but um, from an owner driver perspective, if you're getting a trip rate uh, and you're paying for the cost of your vehicle and everything, uh, the idea is to embed those costs with a cost recovery model into the rate that you're getting, as well as to make sure that all working time is compensated, even on uh, driving time. This, of course, applies to not just owner drivers, but all drivers. Um, and there's a calculation to make that happen. Um, and that, uh, yeah, and uh, this is applicable again to all drivers. So you would have a, a, for an employee driver, an hourly weight that is equalized with an owner driver's rate rate, or, you know, in the European context, obviously, there's this goal of, of equalizing the rates of, of pay or the wages between uh, uh, cross-border drivers and, and national drivers. Um, this is what this looks like in Korea. So in Korea, we, we set two rates. We set the rate that the clients have to pay to transport companies. Uh, and then we set the, the rate of pay that transport companies have to pay to truck drivers based on a cost recovery model. That's what the cost recovery model looks like, but I don't have time to go into it. So, so that, and, and this is important for sustainability and I'll, I'll talk about why in one second. And the, the, for the system, the main principles of the system to set these rates that are important, I think, from a European uh, perspective is that A, unions are, participate. Um, so in Korea, we have an actual quad partite rate setting committee, the clients, transport companies, us, and the government. Um, and that uh, obligations are put at clients at the top of the supply chain uh, so that they have to make sure that the rates are sustainable throughout their supply, their, their contracting chains, and that there's monitoring enforcement based on chain of responsibility principles, meaning that Every the every, starting from the client uh, down to the bottom of the chain, there's monitoring report and enforcement at, at each of those levels. So client responsibility is key, and I said this is done in South Korea through the rates model, but in other places, 
it's done in different ways. So in California, it's joint and several liability uh, in port trucking. If you didn't, you don't pay the right wage, the client can be sued. Um, in Australia, they use the term chain of responsibility. Of course, in France, we have due diligence. So if you can say that this is a human rights violation, you can make a big French company re responsible. And of course, in the ITF with some other international organizations, we have a goal and in some cases agreements with clients that set standards and then the trade union is investigating and enforcing those standards and that's an agreement with the clients and this, this is important. Um, so the impact on safety in Korea, uh, since the introduction of safe rates after six months, 33.6% reduction in speeding, 39.9% in overloading uh, from a driver survey that we, we commissioned. Uh, there are also studies from other countries that talk about if a rate, a rate of pay increases, then uh, the likelihood of crashes decrease. Um, and I think that so in terms of decent work, we're talking not just about setting conditions, but we're talking about creating an industry structure that makes it possible to have decent work within road transport. Um, this is so again, equalize conditions to minimize the race to the bottom in social dumpling. Uh, in Korea, the research shows that by doing this, we're removing links in the subcontracting chain because you know you have to pay a certain rate, so there's no there's no point in trying to cost cut in that way. Um, and uh, it's an incentive to direct employment and client responsibility. What this means for sustainability is, and I think this is really important, is the idea of cost recovery is that. Um, Clients at the top of supply chains are not paying for the externalities, the social externalities of their operations. They're not paying for safety by paying all driving time, for example, and they're also not paying environmentally sustainable, uh, you know, environmental costs uh, of, of um, tr transport by trucks. And so, uh, for example, their long waiting times because they don't have to pay for it in ports and things. Uh, there are more empty trips because they don't have to pay for it. In Korea, we have massive, we, we, one of our issues is oversupply uh, because that's a way to induce competition. And so this type of system creates efficiency, uh, forces clients and uh, big transport companies to reduce waiting time, reduce empty trips. It controls oversupplies. And then ultimately, I think it'll end, um, excuse me, uh, we're just talking about how you could uh, embed in a rates model like this or a pay model, a cost recovery model, the cost of, for example, electric vehicles and the cost of just transition. And so uh, there's an opportunity to make this a more sustainable model, although we're just having that discussion. I would just say that in our union, KPTU, my union, we have both rail and uh, truck drivers. We haven't had this discussion yet, but I mean, in theory, this will raise the cost of, as Christina said, less jobs better jobs for truck drivers. So it should raise the cost of, of truck transport in by embedding all of the social costs into it, which in theory could then have an impact on rail transport in Korea. That won't happen because as I said, we're an island, we don't have cross border, we don't have a industry, a, a market of scale for, for freight yet until we have you know peace with North Korea. But um, in another context that might be one of the um, yes, and you can have the slides later, uh, but that might be one of the, the, the at least theoretical results, but we haven't, we haven't done this uh, long enough to be able to talk about that concretely, but theoretically it's an interesting discussion. Thank you very much, Wolsan. That was a very interesting presentation even though it's an island, but I think it was very interesting to have this positive example, even though far away. And the first uh, tests have shown that uh, safety on roads has increased and social dumping could be restrained. But of course, long-term consequences need to be examined further. Thank you very much also for talking about the role of the ITF and the ILO. That's also a quite important point that uh, there can be global standards coming from that organization. And then now I'm looking forward to hearing from Katarina Konechka. She was chief negotiator from her uh, party and her group, the left, about the mobility package that was decided upon a year ago. And 
this mobility package has the goal to restrict social dumping in road transport. And I think uh, it's quite a mixed uh, stock that was taken. But maybe Katarzyna can talk more about it. You have the floor. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Of course, I can never say no to uh, Cornelia. Everything is okay. I hope you can hear me. Yes, I hope so. My contribution will show, unfortunately, that to ensure uh, good uh, uh, social and working conditions for the transport workers is not easy. It uh, requires a lot of effort. It's a lot of rigorous work and uh, many legal discussions. Uh, therefore, it might be a topic that is easily neglected and uh, for some very um, abstract. Therefore, I uh, appreciate today's meeting uh, because I know that you all are really striving for a change. Um, all of you will have heard of Mobility Package 1. So uh, I would just like to briefly remind you that this is the first mobility package uh, out of three packages in which uh, there are eight reports, eight areas divided into two groups. The first group is uh, technical with uh, reports on uh, hired uh, freight transport, uh, and uh, Eurovignette. And the second group uh, is a rather political one. For example, uh, driving and rest time rules, tachographs, posting of drivers, and uh, cabotage. I uh, took over the report uh, on the posting of drivers from a former colleague, uh, Maria Kilonen, who had not been re-elected into the European Parliament in 2019, but uh, she had done a great deal of work, mainly in the parliamentary negotiations. I uh, was supposed uh, to lead the three-partite negotiations and a subsequent vote in plenary. It was an extremely difficult uh, task also from the technical point of view, because the reports on the posting of workers, uh, tachographs and cabotage were interlinked. So if uh, one part uh, uh, in one report changed, it meant also changes in another or all reports as well. The meetings of the shadow rapporteurs had to take place at the same time and the representatives of the employment committee also took part in these meetings uh, because they have exclusive remit. Uh, over certain parts. So while uh, during the normal uh, meetings of shadow reporters, there are only 20 people, we had sometimes 80 people attended there. Uh, besides the complex technicalities, uh, we also had to face the opposition of almost half of the European Parliament. The European Parliament was divided uh, into in both the committee and in the plenary, where the package uh, had not been approved during the first reading because we uh, missed one single vote uh, for the amendment for the posting of drivers. And then it was sent back to the committee. One half, the eastern half of the EU, was convinced that the mobility package would destroy the road freight transport due to the newly imposed restrictions. Those countries do not mind that the truck drivers from Eastern Europe spend up to 50 weeks a year on the road, uh, which was also one of the amendments tabled that the driver would be obliged to return to return at least once every 50 weeks um, to home. Uh, they didn't, those countries did not mind that those drivers spend sometimes two days traveling in a van that will bring them to the track where they have to immediately begin their work. And that they have to help with loading goods during their statutory rest time. The social conditions 
as we uh, can see, are uh, sometimes not uh, an obstacle for the uh, Eastern European countries. They only thought that if we make changes, everything will collapse. I do not know exactly how much the road freight transport contributes now to the GDP of one uh, unnamed Eastern EU country, but during our negotiations, it was 16% uh, of GDP. For example, in Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, the road freight transport was 16% of GDP, which is uh, incredibly high percentage. And it's very similar in other East European uh, countries. Uh, the representatives of ambassadors, uh, transport ministers, their secretaries, and even the prime minister of some uh, states um, asked for the meeting because they wanted to uh, put the rapporteurs under pressure. And that all to the detriment of the truck drivers and their conditions. Gradually, we managed to undermine the arguments of the Eastern uh, member states against the mobility package. And in the end, we fortunately managed to approve the package with a fragile, tiny majority. However, this has not discouraged our opponents and they are still trying to come up with amendments for the next reports that are currently being discussed. Um, uh, so that at least some parts of the package changes in their favor. Fortunately, they do not have the required majority. They even um, managed to get the newly elected Commission for Transport, Adina Valean from Romania, on their side. Uh, no wonder Romania was one of the loudest opponents. The commissioner uh, should be neutral, of course. Uh, it looks like it uh, on the first glance, but we know very well uh, on whose side she is. Uh, so we know that even appointing the commissioners might influence uh, the process. The biggest uh, advantages of the package are in uh, as for the driving and rest time the followings the biggest success was that the regulation applies also to the light commission vehicles um, since uh, the regulation uh, enters into force the light uh, commercial vehicles uh, from 2.5 tons will have to be equipped also with the intelligent tachographs and the so-called long breaks uh, must be spent outside the cabin of the vehicle, uh, for example, in the hotel, and it had to be paid by the employer. It's also possible to spend the break at the certified rest areas, which uh, must meet strict requirements for the safety, hygiene and services. Then there is a regular return home every three weeks and all vehicles in international transport must be equipped with an intelligent tachograph. As for the posting of drivers, the report I took over from my predecessor, the driver is considered to be posted if he carries out a cabotage and the so-called cross trade. And uh, the posting ends after leaving the host state and the previous periods do not add up. A driver will be exempted from posting if he carries out bilateral transport from or to his member state and is allowed to carry out a maximum of two so-called cross trades. Implementation of an IMI database uh, in which the documents about posting will be archived before the start of the journey has also uh, taken place. And uh, the transport companies from third countries must not have any competitive advantage over the European ones. As for the cabotage, uh, there should be no longer any letterbox uh, companies. Uh, every company should have an adequate facilities and a number of uh, parking lots. Uh, cabotage will also apply to light commercial vehicles and buses. And um, cabotage will only be possible under specific uh, con conditions. I will not uh, uh, burden you with that. Uh, then there is also a new ERRU database, uh, kind of a register of um, uh, transport operators. 
And uh, it's also important that every eight weeks, uh, the vehicle has to return to the country of establishment. And the new commissioner mentioned that uh, this return will certainly be incompatible with the ambitions of the so-called New Green Deal and ask for a study on behalf of the European Commission. Because sometimes the vehicles do not return to the country of establishment, only the drivers uh, change. But And the study says that if every vehicle in international traffic has to return to the member states of establishment every eight weeks, it would increase the CO2 emissions by 2.9 million tons in 2023. I think this might be true, but only if the vehicles return empty. And according to the model of uh, market-driven economy, this is hardly possible because every transport company will make sure that an empty uh, car uh, travels as few kilometers as possible and will certainly find some car cargo uh, that should be transported back to the uh, member state of establishment every eight weeks. This uh, package should improve the working and social conditions and also safety of the transport workers, but it probably will take some time before it is fully implemented, before all the vehicles are equipped with the intelligent tachographs uh, and um, before all the member states will be trained to control this data, that will certainly take some time. Uh, we believe that thanks to the mobility package, the fraud with uh, documents will also become extremely difficult uh, because those documents will be stored in an online database. The employers will also not be able to force drivers to manipulate the tachographs anymore. The conditions for drivers will improve because there is nothing worse than to have a tired driver rushing down the highway at 100 kilometers per hour behind the wheel of a 40 ton monster truck. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I really appreciate um, your uh, effort, dear colleagues, who really try to uh, be at the side uh, of the workers and we could um, together uh, counter the capitalistic, capitalist world whose only interest is to gain profits. So we had a lot of support uh, also in trade unions and thanks to them, we managed to achieve so many positive things to, for the transport workers. Of course, we are not uh, at, in the end of the, our journey, but I think we've already gained a lot of positive things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Katharina. Uh, thank you very much for giving us an idea of what has already been achieved and where there is still room for improvements and what could be expected from the European Union level, from the Commission, for example, uh, where parts of the mobility package will perhaps not be implemented, whether it will be deferred, whether it will be reopened, whether it will be um, disputed, um, uh, that will have to be followed very closely, of course. Now I would like to give every one of you, all of the participants, the opportunity to uh, raise your questions.